Thank you for joining us for our live virtual MDA Engage IBM event. I'm excited that we have three days of wonderful information that is devoted to the inclusion body myositis community. My name is Nicole Petrowski and I am the Community Education Specialist in the Community Education and Insight Department for MDA. We are so glad to have you join us today for this important and educational seminar. The seminar today is part of our larger MDA flagship community event series, which began in 2018 and focuses on bringing the neuromuscular community together around education and social opportunities. Currently on the screen right here is a list of some other engaged seminars we will be hosting this year. We are currently in the process of rescheduling our spring events, so be sure to check back on the MDA Engage section on mda.org for updates on other virtual and in-person events this year. And as like everyone else here, MDA is very aware of the pandemic affecting all of us right now. And therefore we have created a resource page dedicated to COVID-19 resources and recommendations for our neuromuscular community. Please visit MDA uh, org slash COVID-19 for up-to-date information to participate in our MDA patient and caregiver survey and view important recordings such as our Facebook live events surrounding COVID-19. Now I have just a few housekeeping items to go over before we begin. We are recording today's event and we will be posting it to the MDA.org website for on-demand viewing down the road and to ensure that those who aren't able to join us live today are able to access this information. For those of you joining the live event, please know that all phone lines have been muted. We will be having Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so please be sure to use, utilize the Q&A window um, to type in your questions. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, a tray of icons would appear. So please click on the Q&A icon to open the feature and enter your question to host. You don't need to wait until the presentation is over before submitting your questions. As questions come up during the presentation, please feel free to send those in. Before we begin our seminar, I would like to say a special thank you to our chair, Dr. Tassin Mozafar from University of California, Irvine for all of his hard work in helping provide the vision, topics, and expertise for this virtual education event. This event wouldn't be possible without his participation and support. And I would also like to thank Elise Qualley, the Director of the Community Education and Insight Department and our Chief Privacy Officer for MDA, who is assisting me with behind the scenes for this webinar. Finally, I want to say a big thank you to everyone in the IBM community who's joining us today. At MDA, community education is important to us and we are happy to be able to offer this opportunity and are incredibly thankful to have you all joining us today. And just a reminder, we will be taking questions after Dr. Mozafar's presentation, and we will get to as many questions as possible. To kick off our IBM seminar, I want to introduce to you our event chair and presenter, Dr. Tassin Mozafar. He is a professor of neurology, orthopedic surgery, and pathology, and interim chair of the Department of Neurology at University of California, Irvine. He is the director of the UC Irvine MDA ALS and Neuromuscular Center and the director of the UC Irvine Neuromuscular Program. He is the immediate past chair of the Neuromuscular Section at the American Academy of Neurology, as well as the immediate past chair of the Medical Advisory Board of the Myositis Association. Additionally, Dr. Mozafar serves as chair of one of the biomedical communities and chairs the Compliance Committee for the Institutional Research Board and the Institutional Liaison for trial, Trials Innovation Hub for the Center for Translational Sciences Award at University of California, Irvine. And with that, I would like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Mozavar. Thank you, Nicole. Um, it's a real pleasure. Um, and I, I hope that um, you guys will enjoy this series of seminars. What Nicole and I put together are a series of three talks that you will hear over the next three days. I, I chose not to do it all in one day, which I personally feel gets very tiring and I, I, I hope you guys agree with me. So you will hear uh, Dr. Alfano tomorrow, who's a wonderful um, physical therapist, um, to talk about physical therapy issues as well as some of the outcome related issues and clinical trials in IBM. And then Dr. Schmidt um, from Germany, 
uh, will talk about one of his favorite topics, which is the issue of swallowing and dysphagia in inclusion body myositis. My job, um, and again, I am going to warn you in advance that I'm not going to be talking specifically about therapeutics or therapy, um, but I, my job is to give you an overview of what our current understanding of inclusion body myositis is, especially the sporadic uh, form. If I can have the next slide, Nicole. And then these are my disclosures as being an active in the field, um, especially neuromuscular disorders. I advise a number of um, disease foundations as well as um, a pharmaceutical companies. And we have research funding from a number of sources, including federal sources for um, disorders and neuromuscular diseases. Next slide, please. So um, the, the, the a format of the talk will be a case presentation highlighting some of the challenges in diagnosis of IBM, some of the historical aspects, the epidemiology, and then I'll concentrate on the clinical and muscle pathology features of it, what our current consensus is in terms of clinical classification, and then this age-old question whether this IBM is an inflammatory disorder uh, versus a degenerative disease, um, and what are our avenues for treatment at this point. Next slide. So I'm going to start with um, the case of one of my patients, and she's somebody that I've been following now for almost 15 years, um, and she was referred to me by one of our senior faculty members um, with a diagnosis of polymyositis. Um, she obviously was much younger at that time. Um, she was um, in her late 40s, early 50s, um, and had presented to Dr. Starr, who's my faculty member, um, with about another uh, few years earlier than that, with progressive symmetric weakness um, of the extremities. Our uh, CK was elevated um, at 450, our upper limit being 240, and her um, con nerve conduction studies and EMG studies showed a irritable myopathy, which means that there was evidence for muscle necrosis and muscle irritability on the EMG exam. Next. We decided to do a muscle biopsy, and she had been on steroids, so I had to take her off the steroids first um, before I did another biopsy on her, and it clearly showed an inflammatory uh, myopathy uh, with, evi with evidence for inflammation in the inner portions of the muscle, which is the endomysial region. Um, and so it looked very much like what people would consider polymyositis. Um, there were no rimmed vacuoles, and there, um, but there were some fibers that had reduced staining on one of the mitochondrial stains. Um, so we decided to go with the concept uh, that she has a symmetric weakness and she has infl inflammation in the muscle. Therefore, this must be polymyositis. So we treated her with prednisone. We treated her with azathioprine, otherwise known as Imuran. We even added methotrexate, given the fact that she had a lot of cytochrome oxidase, negative fibers, and eventually IVIG, because one of her main features was swallowing abnormality. <clears throat> and Dr. Schmidt will tell you that there's some evidence that IVIG may have a role there um, as well. Next slide. Over the years, however, she continued to have minimal response to the treatment but also developed um, asymmetric weakness. So one side was clearly much more affected than the others. Um, and a lot of her weakness was, became more prominent in her finger flexors. So she had difficulty making a fist. She had difficulty with, uh, with manipulating objects from the hand. And then she also developed uh, quadriceps weakness in the thighs. Um, and then, as I mentioned, it, she developed very prominent dysphagia or swallowing abnormality. Around this time, <clears throat> the blood test <coughs> for NP5C1A antibody became available, and we sent it off, and she was positive for that antibody with a reasonably high titers of that antibody. Next slide. So in, um, in conclusion, this is a fairly classical history, especially in women, of inclusion body myositis. And the clues out here were the fact that she, she was above, around the age of 50 uh, or above the age of 50 when she pre first presented. Um, the, there was inflammation on the biopsy, but more importantly, there were cytochrome oxidase negative fibers, um, which, which was one of the clues early on. Then subsequent development of the asymmetric weakness, the forearm uh, weakness, uh, and the finger weakness. 
and the weakness of the quadriceps muscle and wasting of the quadriceps muscle. And then the dysphagia, which is um, very prominent. She had a positive antibody test. But equally important was the fact that despite our best effort with prednisone, with methotrexate, with azathioprine and IVIG, she really did not respond much and continue to decline. So the treatment refractoriness um, is a one big clue out here that we are dealing not with polymyositis, if there is such a thing as polymyositis, but we're dealing with probably inclusion polymyositis. Next slide. So <clears throat> her di eventual diagnosis was sporadic inclusion body myositis. She met the criteria um, for the disease and she was eligible for some of the clinical trials and um, she participated in the Novartis trial um, about three years ago as part of that. Next slide. So um, I want to spend a few words acknowledging the work of some of the legends in the field. Um, sporadic inclusion body myositis is a relatively new disease. Um, it was really described in the late 60s and early 70s, and a lot of the work were done by folks that are uh, shown here. So on the left is Fred Samaha, who was the chief of neurology at Cincinnati, um, but he is generally attributed with the first case description of inclusion body myositis in the early 1970s, um, while, while he was still in Pittsburgh. But really, the, the true description of the disease was um, given by um, uh, George Carpati and Sterling Carpenter, who were neurologists and neuropathologists at the Montreal Neurological Institute in, at McGill in Montreal. Um, and Andy Engel, who is at the Mayo Clinic and still is at the Mayo Clinic practicing at a, um, in, in his late 80s, who really described a lot of the muscle pathology abnormalities, especially the immune abnormalities. Um, King Engel um, and Valerie Askenaz, who were here at, in California, um, took a lot of interest in it. Askenaz described some of the amyloid features of the disease. And Jerry Mandel actually was the first one to show amyloid deposition in the muscle. Next. But as I, as I mentioned, and I apologize, the pictures are not turning out as pretty as I thought it would. Um, but that may be a, a challenge between Windows and Mac uh, computers. But the first description of what looked like um, viral particles um, were uh, in what, what was otherwise a case of polymyositis was described by Dr. Chow, who was a pathologist in Cleveland in the 1960s. And he was doing electron microscopy and showed these inclusions in the body. And that's how the name inclusion body myopathy came about which he was resembled the inclusions that were seen with mums virus. And for the longest time, people were convinced that inclusion body myositis may be related to a viral infection of the muscle. And the changes that we are seeing are related to that. Next. Now, but as I, as I mentioned, the first true description of inclusion body myositis and the name came from this paper um, from Dr. Yunus and Dr. Samaha from Pittsburgh, and this was from 1971, uh, where they not only showed the clinical features, uh, but also showed the specific muscle pathology. Um, <clears throat> even though they called it <coughs> as inclusion body myositis, in retrospect, if you read through the report, and if, um, then you would realize that what they were describing was probably not inclusion body myositis or not the sporadic inclusion body myositis, but familial and inclusion body myopathy. And I have a few slides about this particular disease um, later on in my talk. So the fact that this patient was a 26 year old and the fact that there was symmetric weakness with quadriceps sparing is much more of a feature of GNE myopathy, which is one of the inherited forms of inclusion body myopathy. But if I can show you the pictures, these were some of the pictures they showed and there was inflammation in the muscle. So the arrows are pointing to the inflammation. Next slide. This is the electron microscopy and this is the inclusions that they saw uh, in this muscle. Next. And then these were again a higher power of the inclusion and this is what made people suspect that maybe there is a virus that is causing this disease. Next slide, Nicole. And again, a higher power of that. But as, as I mentioned, the real um, recognition that IBM is a distinct disease 
did not happen till 1978 when George Carpati and Sterling Carpenter and Andy Eisen described all of the what is now considered to be the seminal classical uh, clinical features of it. So their report was of six patients and they emphasized the fact that it's a slowly progressive painless weakness. There is no muscle pain or no myalgias. They emphasize the fact that the weakness tends to be distal, so affecting the, the fingers and the, and the wrist more than the proximal uh, shoulder muscle. Then they emphasize the fact that majority of the patients are male, that there is no skin lesion unlike what we see in dermatomyositis. Um, and they describe pretty much all of the muscle pathology features that we now recognize as an essential characteristic of this disease. Next. So what do we know about the epidemiology or the prevalence of IBM? IBM is the commonest acquired muscle disease above the age of 50. Um, and the concern that we have, at least on the neurology side, and um, that a lot of the patients who have been labeled as polymyositis may not have polymyositis, may actually have IBM. But also, if you think about it, as we get older, we get weaker. Um, and a lot of our weakness, especially the difficulty of getting up from the chair, difficulty going upstairs, is attributed to aging process. But we don't know how many of those truly um, age-related muscle weakness may actually be IBM um, because we don't have a good way of diagnosing them without a muscle biopsy. So the prevalence really depends on how closely you look at um, the disease, what modalities you use to diagnose the disease. So I think the best um, data we have so far comes um, from um, some of the Western uh, Hemisphere data. So if you look at the data from Connecticut, the data from uh, Western um, Hemisphere, also the data from Netherlands, the incidence is probably between 4.7 uh, per million to about 15 per million. Um, if you look at all across, uh, if you look at all ages, not just specific age. Next. But we now think that the prevalence estimates actually increase as we get older. So if you look at 70-year-olds, um, the IBM is about threefold higher than somebody, uh, if you look at only a 40-year-old population or a 50-year-old population. So as we get older, the in chances of developing IBM, the chances of having IBM actually goes up. Um, it is generally considered to be rare among Asian population. It is considered to be rare am amongst African-American populations. Not to say that we have not seen those patients with IBM either. The, the diagnosis is based on um, presence of progressive, asymmetric, painless muscle weakness, that even though in majority of the cases it's supposed to be asymmetric, it may present symmetrically in about 20% of the population. So the case that I showed um, of my patient, who initially presented with symmetric weakness, and that's why she was confused to have polymyositis, but eventually declared her disease to be asymmetric. Um, and that's why the confusion with polymyositis, especially given the fact that they have inflammation of the muscle, can be so easily um, made. Now, there are specific muscles that get involved. So for some reason, um, IBM, the disease process, uh, specifically affects the quadriceps muscles. Um, and we really um, look for evidence for quadriceps muscles involvement. We have had patients who had normal muscle strength but had um, early atrophy of the quadriceps um, that gave away the diagnosis. We've had patients who had normal bulk and normal strength, but yet had abnormal MRI signals from the quadriceps that gave away the diagnosis. So quadriceps is something that we look very carefully at when we try to make a diagnosis of IBM. But the other area, and, and not all patients have quadriceps weakness, they may only have the upper extremity weakness. So the presence of wrist flexor weakness, so the, the, these muscles, or the finger flexor muscles, so these. One of the things that we look for in clinical diagnosis of IBM, and I tell my fellows that you can usually make this diagnosis from the door, is the inability to, to make a fist. So most IBM patients are not able to bury these last two fingers into a fist. So you can overcome the strength of these weakness very easily. And that is a very 
um, credible sign to make a diagnosis of IBM. But IBM can present with hip flexor weakness, more than quadriceps weakness, and it can, some patients can present with foot drop. Um, so again, it, I, I don't think it's the, there always are exceptions to the rule. Next. So as I mentioned, um, hip flexors are involved, and one of my frustrations was that in the Novartis trial, because they specifically indicated that they only want patients whose quadriceps muscles were weaker than the hip flexor muscles, we had to exclude a lot of patients from the trial because they did not meet the criteria that the company had set. And it was a little frustrating for me on that. The deltoids, which are your shoulder muscles uh, that let you um, elevate your arm, are pretty much spared in, in most patients, uh, even in the mid to later parts of the disease. Um, if you look carefully, these patients tend to have evidence for a neuropathy. Pain is generally thought to be not an issue, but the more we deal with IBM patients and um, the more we recognize that pain actually is a prominent feature. It's not been very well characterized. One of the grants that we have written is specifically trying to address the issue of how to recognize and how to quantify these pains and that. But I've had patients who, whose main complaint was pain more than anything else on that. And then the other part that is not very well recognized but doesn't contribute to the morbidity and, and perhaps the mortality um, are the respiratory weakness. Um, so they, they, they do get weakness of the diaphragm muscle, so their respiratory strength is reduced. And the facial weakness, which I, I have to confess till about four years ago, um, I did not believe in facial weakness and IBM, but more and more, and especially in advanced diseases, advanced stages of the disease, the facial weakness is incredibly prominent. Um, and there's some data that may be happening in about 50% of the patients. The biggest problem with IBM, and as uh, they may not be present <clears throat> as a presenting symptom, but almost two thirds of the patients with IBM will develop some degree of swallowing abnormality in the, um, in the advanced stages of the disease. Um, this can be severe enough for to interfere with nutrition. And if somebody has swallowing abnormality as well as face weakness, they can get significant malnutrition <clears throat> and, and weight loss. And I've had patients who had fairly um, serious weight loss because of a combination of the muscle atrophy, which is pure protein, and not being able to take enough food by mouth um, because of the swallowing abnormality. Now, Dr. Um, Schmidt is gonna talk about this on Wednesday, um, the, what different strategies are, how do we pick it up? So I'm not gonna spend any more time on this. Uh, please uh, make sure that you listen to his talk on, on Wednesday. Next. So um, the, the one of the challenges with IBM um, is that the muscle enzymes, especially CK, which uh, rheumatologists and neurologists love to make a diagnosis of, CK, of uh, muscle disease may be normal in some of these patients. Um, or even if they are increased, they are only modestly increased. They're not very high. Um, we recently published a series of 25 patients from our clinic where the highest that we saw was 3,300, but that clearly is an exception. That doesn't happen in all patients of that. Um, some of the other rheumatological tests, and a lot of our patients come through rheumatologists um, and they've had a whole bunch of workup for ANA and some of the other rheumatology labs, and often these testing are negative. The only exception is that there seems to be a strange association with Sjogren's disease. So there is a slightly higher incidence of Sjogren's disease um, in uh, IBM. And then the EMG nerve conduction studies, as in the case of the case that I presented, will show evidence for an irritable myopathy. Um, so till about four years ago, um, we, were, we were resorting to a muscle biopsy in every patient to make a diagnosis of IBM. Um, next. Um, but since then, we've learned the um, utility of MRI. So this is, again, I'm, I'm showing you some of the features of the disease. The top left panel labeled A is the amount of quadriceps atrophy. These are really skinny thigh muscles in patient with IBM. And this is, if somebody comes to my clinic with this feature, I am very concerned that this patient may have IBM. Um, the finger flexor weakness, as I demonstrated, is a very clear sign. So if you look at the right hand, 
the person is able to make a fist, but on the left hand, they're not able to make a fist. And again, one suggesting the disease is asymmetric, but number two, very clearly suggesting that there is a um, clear weakness of the long finger flexors. And you can demonstrate that on the MRI. So if you look at panel C and panel D, this is somebody with thin muscles, but if you look at the MRI, the white signal in the, in the background of gray, the white is muscle edema, suggesting that there is inflammation. And then panel D, I'm sorry, go back for a second, Nicole. The panel D is a cross-section of the thigh muscles, and you can really see the, um, the whiteness of the quadriceps muscles. So these are your thigh muscles. So the panel on the left is the left knee, the panel on the right is the right knee, and you can see muscle involvement quite easily. Uh, but in the bottom scan, you can see that one side is more affected than the other. Next. So the pathology is what makes the diagnosis. Um, and even to this date, um, despite some of the advances, to ultimate diagnosis of IBM requires muscle biopsy and taking a piece of the muscle and looking under the microscope. Um, otherwise, um, you can make a clinical diagnosis, but to get somebody into clinical trials, you have to have a muscle biopsy. The biopsy was best described by George Carpati, um, and he pretty much described all the features, which included uh, extensive amount of inflammation in the endomysium, um, the invasion of non-necrotic muscle fibers. So normally, if you have a muscle fiber that's undergoing necrosis, the natural expectation is that fiber will get invaded by inflammatory cells. It's the invasion of otherwise normal looking fibers that is the more curious feature of this disease. Rimmed vacuoles, and I'll show you examples of all of these. They are mitochondrial abnormalities. Um, there are angular fibers that suggest that there may also be a little bit of neuropathy going on in these patients. And then if you are taking these muscles to electron microscopy, there are specific ultrastructure features that you can show. Next. So this was the original uh, pictures from Carpati's paper, and it shows the trimmed vacuoles. The arrows are pointing to these vacuoles that have um, material around it, and that's what the word rimmed means. Next. These are the in inflammatory infiltrates in the endomysium, um, and some of those inflammatory cells are now invading into muscles, and that muscle otherwise looks relatively normal. So that's what I meant by muscle inflammation, invasion of non-necrotic muscle fibers. This is the angular fibers, the muscle atrophy, and you can see there are patches of very small muscle fibers, suggesting that they may be an element of, uh, of neurogenic uh, disease there. Next. And then these are some of the ultrastructure changes, the tubular filament uh, inclusion, and that's how the name inclusion body myopathy or uh, myositis came about. Inclusion is something that we cannot see on light microscopy. You have to pretty much take it to electron microscopy, which is a much higher view of magnification view. Next. And then later on, um, Dr. Karpati, uh, who unfortunately died too young, uh, in my opinion. Um, but he just demonstrated some of the changes related to um, inflammation. So the expression of the major histocompatibility complex, which is one of the major immune proteins in our body that de determines whether somebody is going to have an autoimmune attack or not, are widely expressed on the muscle membrane. And you have to have this to make a diagnosis on muscle biopsy. And then he also demonstrated that if you look at these rimmed vacuoles, they're remnants of nuclei. And, and he, liked to, he liked to describe it as burst nuclei. So nuclei is an essential component of your cell. In this particular case, for some reason, the, the nuclei degenerates, it bursts or it, uh, it dies and leaves all of these remnants around, which become the rimmed vacuoles. Next. Um, and then Andy Engel, as I mentioned, took real advantage of early um, diagnostic improvements in immunohistochemistry. And he, in, through these series of very elegant papers, showed the nature of the immune attack in, in, in inclusion body myositis. So these are the cytotoxic T cells and the macrophages that are given different colors. So the red is one color, the, the, the green is another color. And when they merge, they become yellow. Um, showing how the, the earliest change is a punching of a hole in the muscle and a gradual invasion of the muscle with inflammatory cells 
eventually causing death of these inflammatory these muscle cells. Next. And then um, Charles Thornton at Rochester showed that there are mitochondrial abnormalities in muscle. Um, so mitochondria are the energy producing cells in the muscle. As we get older, a lot of our mitochondria take a hit from ultraviolet radiation that is present in the, in the air. Um, and DNA does not repair itself. The mitochondria does not have the capacity to repair itself. So the expectation is that as we get older, we will keep accumulating more and more mitochondrial abnormalities. Now, Charles Thornton did a very smart study where he looked at muscle biopsies from young patients, from old patients, and then patients with IBM. And he showed that the amount of mitochondrial abnormality was way beyond what you would even expect from aging process. So granted that these patients are older and they are expected to have mitochondrial abnormalities, but the amount, the degree of mitochondrial abnormality that we see far exceeds <clears throat> that we see in other um, diseases or other otherwise normal, uh, healthy, um, uh, older folks. Next. And this is the same um, slide. This, is, this again is quantification. So if you look at the slide on the right, in the bar graph, which shows that as we get older, we do accumulate some mitochondrial hits, but the amount of mitochondrial abnormality in IBM far exceeds what we expect from just normal aging process. Next. So this is, again, a, a, a snapshot. We, crea we created this in our um, clinic. Um, so this is a, um, the panel on uh, A is a, a HME stain muscle biopsy that shows the rimmed vacuoles. B is the trichrome, which really shows the red rimmed vacuoles on the muscle biopsy. Um, we can, you can see the um, mitochondrial abnormality. One of the ways that we define IBM now is presence of abnormal proteins in the, in the muscle. So the panel to, on the right with the panel uh, labeled F is demonstration that there are abnormal proteins in the muscle. This particular example is TDP43 which is one of the proteins involved in the pathogenesis of IBM, but you can pretty much take any nuclear protein. So amyloid, uh, SMI32, uh, MRIN, uh, um, uh, P62, all of those are present in this muscle. Next. And again, these are some of the other cells that we can see. So you can see presence of inflammatory cells, but also presence of TD, TDP43, um, that is present um, in muscle. And uh, the criteria for diagnosis of IBM requires that the highest level of conviction is not only when you see inflammation, when you see the MSC1 positivity in the way that's shown out here, but you also have to demonstrate abnormal protein accumulation in the muscle fiber, such as TDP42 or amyloid or P62. Next. So um, diagnosis of IBM is based on clinical features, but then you also use pathology and MRI to further confirm that. And I will mention a few words about the antibodies later on in the talk, um, but there are other diseases that can look like. So if you go clinically by clinical picture, patients with um, lumbar spine issues, especially if it affects the quadriceps, can be confused for IBM. There are patients with um, uh, facio-scapular humeral muscular dystrophy that can look like IBM post-polio, uh, especially if it affected the right muscles, can, and because it's asymmetric, can look like IBM and be confused for IBM. But one of the main features, or one of the main um, differential diagnoses is inherited forms of inclusion body myopathy. And again, I'll, I'll say a few words about that. If you go by muscle pathology, IBM is not the only disease that has these rimmed vacuoles. So oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy, which is another inherited muscle disease, um, hereditary IBM, especially the one that is associated with um, frontotemporal dementia and Paget's disease has rimmed vacuoles, myofibular myopathy, which is another important consideration. And then there are some drug uh, myopathies, um, chloroquine, which is getting a lot of press these days um, for COVID. Um, in chlor chloroquine can be toxic to the muscle and can cause a rimmed vacuolar myopathy, very similar to what you see in IBM. Um, 
So when you, I was asked to talk about um, inherited forms of inclusion body myopathy, um, and these were described in the early 80s by the Japanese group led by Dr. Nonaka, and the next slide, and then independently by the Israeli group that described this in a distinct um, population of um, Jews in Israel, especially what they call um, the Iranian Jews or the Iraqi Jews. Uh, which is a form of Sephardic Jews. Um, and um, what they recognize that these patients had quadriceps bearing, but other than, other than that looked very much like IBM, but it was a run, it ran, ran in the families and there were um, a large number of families because these are relatively um, rare um, families and they tend to not assimilate as much. There were large numbers in the family. And then they discovered that they actually were very similar um, to the Japanese population. So the Jap Japanese and the Israeli populations got together. They showed that they were talk essentially talking about the same disease, and they eventually found the genetic mutation for it, which is highlighted in the next um, slide. Um, uh, and next slide, please. So this is the gene. It's called now called GNE myopathy. They simplified the name, so we don't have to go through a long name. GNE myopathy, next slide, is also known as distal myopathy with rimmed vacuoles, known as Nonaka's disease or hereditary IBM2, next. And it's an autosomal recessive disease, which means that it skips generation. Um, the use, disease usually starts in late teens and early 20s. It presents with bilateral foot drop. The next muscle that usually gets involved is hamstrings. Um, and then it progresses to severe four-link weakness, um, uh, in, but very characteristically spares the quadriceps. In California, um, especially in the LA region, we have a large number of these patients, um, mainly in the Persian Jewish communities, but we also see it in Southeast Asian and South Asian population. So I'm originally from Pakistan, and the first few patients that I saw were all of Pakistani descent um, or Indian descent. The other disease that we need to think about and talk about, especially in the context of IBM, is this um, disease called um, familial myopathies with Paget's disease. And that I think, uh, Nicole, you may have skipped one slide. If you can go back, maybe. Okay, go next, please. And next. So this was originally described in the um, 80s um, and 90s, and then was finally um, given a form where Dr. Kimonas, who's, who is one of my colleagues here at UC Irvine, described patients what would look like inclusion body myopathy. So they had muscle weakness, they had quadriceps weakness uh, with a very prominent um, uh, inclusion bodies and rimmed vacuoles on the muscle biopsy. But in addition to the muscle weakness, they had two other things. They had Paget's disease of the bone, which is a degenerative disease of the bone. Um, and they also developed, some family members also developed a form of dementia called frontotemporal dementia. So she used to be in Springfield at that time in Illinois. She worked with Alan Pestrong and described that this particular disease uh, is linked to the VCP gene, which is a very important gene involved in cell processing. Next. Um, but very early on, they also described that there were families that looked like um, the patients that Dr. Kimonas described, but did not have mutations in the VCP. And subsequently, they have now find multiple genes that uh, look like um, hereditary forms of inclusion body myositis. So a new terminology was described, which is now called multi-system proteinopathy, which are a group of disorders that have inclusion body myopathy. They have Paget's disease, they have frontotemporal dementia, but some of these patients also develop Lou Gehrig's disease. Some of these patients develop Parkinson's disease. So it's a disease that is multi-system um, involvement. And we've had patients who were stable with a muscle weakness for 20 years and very rapidly declined because they developed motor neuron disease or Lou Gehrig's disease on top of it. Next. So this is uh, luckily this is a rare disease. It's an autosomal dominant disease. Um, um, with um, all of these are associated with Paget's disease of the bone, and as I said, rarely they also get frontotemporal dementia. And 
and ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. The presentation can be very similar to IBM and, and I know of cases that were originally thought to have IBM and were in clinics, um, very uh, reputable clinics with that diagnosis before somebody did genetic testing on them and figured out that they actually had an inherited form of IBM. Um, it's very similar to IBM. Uh, it can be asymmetric um, and it can have scapular winging, which is one of the features that we look about. Um, there are now at least five genes that are described with this. BCP, which was the original gene, still is the most common. But then you have diseases that have been described with optineurin mutations, P62 mutations, and a group of these RNA processing genes called HNRNPA, uh, which also have these genes as well. Um, the mechanism is thought to be an impairment of autophagy, which is the cell process by which uh, muscle cells get, get rid of junk from their, from their substance. Next. So there have been a variety of classification systems that have been uh, proposed over the years. Um, Burge Crick's in Rochester and, uh, proposed the criteria that was you defined in 1995. It is perhaps the most rigid criteria, the most strict criteria, and you have to have um, muscle evidence for um, uh, not only the inclusion uh, on electron microscopy, but also evidence for immunohistochemistry abnormality of muscle abnormalities. The criteria that we use now is the European Neuromuscular Center criteria or the ENMC criteria from 2011. It's not a perfect criteria. There are problems with it, but that's the best we have right now. Um, Tom Lloyd and Steve Greenberg um, also evaluate, critically evaluated this um, criteria and have shown the ways that we can improve on it. Um, but just to give you an example, this was the, the Greeks criteria, very rigid, very strict. Uh, and if I have tried to apply this criteria to get you, uh, patients with IBM into clinical trials, half of them will probably fail. But if you look at the next criteria, which is the ENMC 2011 criteria, um, it actually gives um, different levels of conviction. So you can have a clinical pathologically defined IBM, which is the best evidence, uh, but you can also qualify somebody based on <clears throat> clinically defined IBM and probable IBM. Next. So what's the evidence? Um, and I, I have to confess that I tend to be a believer still in the inflammatory theory. And this theory has been given a lot of cred credence recently through the work of Dr. Greenberg and uh, Mary Lee Needham in Australia as well. So the, the evidence that inflammation is the first feature of the disease rather than the rimmed vacuole. Um, and a lot of people have made comparisons to Alzheimer's disease when it comes to inclusion body myositis. And you see the same thing out there. Alzheimer's disease clearly has a lot of degeneration, but they also have a lot of inflammation. Um, but um, as you probably are aware of, a lot of the trials, clinical trials of anti-inflammatory agents in Alzheimer's have failed miserably. Um, despite um, our best effort. Um, the necrotic muscle fibers are clearly auto-invasive, which means that they are expressing an antigen on the cell surface. They are in inviting the in inflammatory cells to come and invade. And if you look for inflammation evidence, evidence for autoimmunity, it's rampantly uh, present in these muscles. And more commonly, uh, or more recently, um, there is a specific antibody um, that was described. There are uh, uh, abnormal lymphocytes that are associated with IBM, and I will show you some evidence. So the data that it's, mount it's mounting, that there is a very, very, very prominent inflammatory response, and there is data that suggests that the inflammation may be prim the primary issue rather than a secondary issue. Next. <coughs> So Steve Greenberg um, took uh, an interest in IBM in the early 2000s when he joined um, Brigham and Women and was the first one to show that in addition to lymphocytes, there are also plasma cells. And, and those who are not familiar with plasma cells, plasma cells are the immune cells that, in, that um, produce antibodies. Um, so, you, if, um, so when he saw these plasma cells, he became a little curious because he said if there are plasma cells, there must be immunoglobulin molecules in the muscle. And he showed that there were immunoglobulin transcripts 
that were clonally restricted, which means that they were only one type that were being produced, suggesting that there is an autoimmune disease. And then very soon afterwards, he described these antibodies in IBM. And again, I apologize for the um, slide. Um, the, it seems to be a little out of whack, and that's probably a, a conversion issue from Mac to Windows. But he was the first one to show that there were specific autoantibodies called NT5C1A antibodies that are present in uh, IBM patients with a specificity of almost 90 plus percent. Um, and the rule that I follow generally is that if you have muscle weakness and if you have antibodies of this kind, you probably have IBM. It's still not strong enough for us to say that we don't need a muscle biopsy. We still need to do a muscle biopsy to confirm it, but it definitely leads us to the right direction and it helps us prevent therapeutic misadventures in a lot of cases on that. Next. So as I said, the NT5C1A antibodies are present uh, and the, the data seems to be um, changing. So the, I, I would say the, current, the correct figure is between 30% to 70%, depending on where you set your cutoff for the assay. So sensitivity is low, but the specificity, which is means that if you have the antibody, you're likely to have the disease and there aren't going to be any false negatives, is very high. So this, most investigators would agree that the specificity is upwards of 90 plus percent on that. Um, in our hands, and I'll show you some data, the antibody suggests a more severe type of disease. Um, and patients who had the antibody um, also tend to have a lot more barbar dysfunction. One of the curious features is there are patients with HIV who tend to develop an inclusion body myositis-like disease. Um, and every single one of those patients who have HIV have been antibody positive. There have almost been very, very few cases of antibody negative uh, HIV. So Dr. Goyle and my group, um, we published this paper in 2015, um, and uh, actually 2016, the, the, the online version came out in 2015. And what we showed in a series of five patients, next um, slide, please, um, is that the patients who had the antibody tend to have more severe proximal weakness. So they had difficulty with time get up, which is a function of your hip, hip muscle strength. They had lower lung capacity, which was before this not very well recognized. A majority of the patients with the antibody required either a walker or a wheelchair, where none of the patients uh, with uh, antibody negative status required any of these ambulation devices. And the amount of dysphagia was much higher in patients who were antibody positive versus negative. Um, this was a sort of an important paper that really suggested differences. And this work was replicated. So this is the work from the European group. These are about now 300 patients. And this is retrospective. So they went back and looked at their charts. And they confirmed that there is a difference. Um, antibody patients um, tend to have more severe weakness. They have specific muscle abnormalities. They had lower weakness or proximal weakness. But the most striking feature of this paper was that patients who were antibody positive um, lived um, um, less than people who were seronegative. So if uh, antibody positive patients on an average lived about eight years less than patients who were seronegative, suggesting that the disease phenotype, and it may be related to swallowing abnormalities, it may be related to respiratory abnormalities, we don't know why the mortality and morbidity is affected, but they tend to live less than patients who are antibody negative. Next. And then I think this is a very important paper, and, um, and this is a Japanese paper. And what this group of um, Japanese investigators did was they drew blood from patients with IBM. So there were some of the antibody, there were some of them were antibody positive and some of them were antibody negative. And they took this blood and they put it into mice and they put it onto muscle that were cultured on a dish. And they showed that only blood from patients who were anti antibody positivity made pathological changes, whereas the blood from antibody negative patients did not have any effect on the mice and did not have any effect on the cell cultures as well. So they, it, it, in, it suggests the idea that the autoimmune disease or the immune abnormality 
is what's driving the degeneration of the muscle rather than degeneration driving the inflammation of the muscle. And that, which is, to now, um, that's been the concept that most people have. Next. And then more recently, Dr. Greenberg, who's been very persistent with trying to characterize IBM, um, showed that um, almost 60% um, of the patients had these very atypical lymphocytes or blood cells um, in, with IBM that almost looked like a form of slow blood cancer um, that, that, had, that is seen in the cancer centers. Um, and so it's a, it's a rare com form of ca cancer called T-cell large granular leukemia. On that. And he showed that this is predominantly a feature in IBM. Next. Um, and then more recently, he, he characterized it even further, and this showed that up to 80% of IBM patients, and this was independently confirmed by our group. We've been working with him um, on trying to validate some of this data and trying to look at clinical correlates of this data, um, showed um, that about 80% um, of the patients with IBM have very high levels of a particular form of lymphocyte that expresses a marker called KLRG1. Um, and this KLRG1 has is, is been well known in the cancer field. It's a marker of what we call uh, senescent cells or aging uh, unresponsive cells. So it suggests that somehow patients with IBM, the immune cells in their muscles and in the immune cells in their blood, all of a sudden have responding, stopped responding to immune therapies. They've become senescent or they've become unresponsive uh, and they are not going to respond to conventional immunotherapy or conventional chemotherapy. And this is seen not only in IBM, this is seen in asthma, this is seen in rheumatoid arthritis, this is seen in a variety of other medicine, uh, med medical disorders. So there is this concept of, um, uh, of aging process or, or chronic stimulation of the immune cells because of infection or inflammation that eventually leads to exhaustion of these immune cells. And that's why IBM probably is the way it is, not responding to treatment. Next. But at the same time, you have very strong and very good data that is in parallel. A lot of this work came from Dr. Askenaz's clinic at USC, but Dr. Delakas and other folks also um, have shown this data where there is evidence for amyloid uh, activation, amyloid deposition in the muscle, um, very similar to what happens in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and as, as you know, amyloid is an insoluble protein that sort of interferes with normal functions of the muscles and normal functions of the cell. There's also um, building evidence that the, the, one of the problems in IBM is the inability of the, of the cells, the muscle cells, to handle abnormal proteins. So normally they have a good mechanism to destroy uh, abnormal protein through the proteasomal system, as well as through some, a process called autophagy. Um, but there is a, a impairment of those processes and these abnormal proteins cannot be get rid, getting rid of. They keep accumulating in the muscles and they interfere with the normal functions of the muscle cells. Next. So in the end, whether it's inflammation, whether it's the mitochondria, whether it's the aging process, uh, whatever that may be, the ultimate result is cell death, uh, accumulation of these abnormal proteins, further poisoning of the mitochondria. And it's a vicious cycle and it keeps complicating and exacerbating the problem. So uh, we really need to define, one, what these processes are. And like what we do in cancer, um, the approach to treatment may have to be multi-pronged. You cannot just um, treat one thing in isolation. You may have to do a combination of treatment to go after the different disease processes. Next. Again, the, if you look at the rimmed vacuoles, you can stain it for pretty much any protein you prefer. All of these are nuclear proteins, so whether it's TDP43, whether it's SMI31, whether it's MRIN, um, you will see it. Um, so suggesting that these are degenerating nuclei that, and what you're seeing is nothing more than nuclear debris, but it is 
the degeneration path that you're interested in. You, you want to get to the bottom of what's causing the degeneration in these muscles. Thanks. So um, as I suggested, in the, because of the involvement of the multiple system in the inherited forms of IBM, the fact that TDP43, which is an RNA processing and gene is also involved in sporadic IBM, there is this concern that IBM may also be an RNA disorder. Um, and that's why we see similarities with um, VCP myopathy. That's why we see similarities with HNR and PA1 uh, diseases as well. Next. So there have been a number of treatment trials in IBM. They're very early on in the disease, steroids were tried because that's what we do best in terms of inflammatory myopathy. Um, but steroids did not really work um, very well in IBM. There have been trials of methotrexate. There have been trials of antithymocyte globulin. There have been Marino Stilakas ran a whole bunch of trials on IVIG. Um, none of them seem to have worked, although there was a hint, and I think Dr. Schmidt's going to talk about this on Wednesday, um, that IVIG may have a role in patients with severe dysphagia. Um, anabolic steroids, especially oxandrolon, has been tried in IBM. Um, interferons, um, and there is um, some evidence that gamma interferon is involved in the disease process, but the intro interferon trials also fail. And then Dr. Delacas, just before he left the NIH, did a trial of CAMPATH, which was a somewhat controversial trial. There's still a um, um, body of data that's being analyzed from that trial. But in, in short, the CAMPATH trial had a very uh, small effect in the short term, but had really no improvement in the long run um, as well. The, um, the, the top slide shows that very early on in the disease, so this is a slide from 1978. And again, remember the disease was really described in 1978. But even very early on, there was a recognition that the disease does not respond to immunosuppressive agents. Um, and this was, again, um, suggested um, in the original paper, but also by Dr. Chow's um, paper um, in, in 1987, that it um, is a treatment-resistant form of what he called as polymyositis. Next. But there's also a disturbing um, um, body of literature. Um, and this was done by um, Olivier Benveniste, who's um, a myologist in Paris, along with David Hilton Jones, who's in Oxford. Um, and they showed that patients with you know, IBM who were treated with immunosuppressants in the long run did worse. Um, and uh, as a disclaimer, um, I used to page treat patients with IVIG and I used to treat patients with methotrexate. And I stopped doing that after this paper came out in 2011, because if you look at this paper, there are methodological problems with this paper. I will give you that. But there is a strong suggestion that patients who were treated, um, again, this is a retrospective review, so we had no way of controlling for it. But patients who were treated in the long run, if you followed them for muscle weakness, if you followed them for use of adaptive devices, et cetera, they actually were worse. Now, it's possible that they were worse to start with or they had more aggressive disease. It also raises the possibility that some of that inflammation that we are seeing in the muscle is a protective inflammation there to do the normal healing process of the muscle. We really don't know why this happens, but there is a suggestion. And that's why, at least on the neurology side, unfortunately not on the rheumatology side, but on the neurology side, most neurologists do not treat uh, IBM patients with immunosuppressants or IVIG. Next. But the other um, um, line of evidence, and I think I've shown you some of this, it's also possible that we are treating, that inflammation is a main feature of the disease. We're just treating the wrong types of cells. So this is, again, based on Dr. Goldberg's data. And there were two groups. There was an original group from Karolinska Institute in Sweden, but also Dr. Greenberg's group in Boston that suggested that the cells, immune cells in IBM, undergo a transformation where they, they lose their CD28 cell surface marker, which is a very important marker that allows these cells to interact with other immune cells. And they start acquiring another marker called CD57, 
in KLRG1. Again, these are suggestive of senescent aging cells that are exhausted, that are probably overstimulated. And these are the very cells that do not respond to conventional uh, immunotherapy or chemotherapy. Our group has been particularly interested in these cells because they also express a type of potassium channel called KV1.3. And this work was done by George Chandy, who used to be at Irvine and now is a professor of physiology in Singapore. But he suggested that we should go after the KV1.3 cells and he was developing drugs for it, uh, which are now licensed to other agents as well. So that's one of the reasons we started looking at this next. So um, there are currently a number of strategies that are in the work. So even though IBM remains untreatable without a cure, and there have been a number of treatment trials that have unfortunately failed, there is a lot to look forward to. Um, and so one of the trials that's being planned right now is to go after those atypical lymphocytes or the KLRG positive lymphocytes. Um, again, any treatment that is developed for that is also going to be helpful in, in low-grade cancers. So Dr. Greenberg has been working on that. There is a trial that he's planning to run um, through his company. Um, and it is planned for Q, uh, the third quarter of this year. But I am I'm willing to bet that because of the current pandemic, there probably will be a little bit of a delay on that. So I, I would anticipate that this probably will start the fourth quarter of this year, if not next early next year. Our group is very actively working on the potassium channel inhibition strategy um, using the existing um, blocker that was developed already at UC Irvine, and UC Irvine has the intellectual property on it, but there are other inhibitors that potentially are available, so we are working on that. Dr. Benveniste's group in Paris has suggested a clinical trial of using, uh, they, they completed a, a clinical trial of rapamycin, He's proposing a phase three trial of Evrolimus, which is a better drug. Um, this has already gone through the planning phase. Currently, they're looking for funding, especially for the US sites. They're gonna be four sites in the US, um, and they're also looking for the drug supply for this. And so it still has not started as yet. Uh, Aramoclomal, which is a protein stabilizer, is currently in phase three clinical trial. Uh, some of you may have participated in that. It's run through um, uh, University of Kansas as well as University College London uh, in, uh, in the UK. It's by a company called Orphazine. Um, again, the, the patient enrollment has ended where the patients are still receiving the dosing. Um, and we had to switch um, our strategies because of the COVID pandemic. So we are doing some of the visits as virtual visits where we talk to the patient over a video link rather than in person seeing the patient as well. And then there are other therapies being trialed. So the senolytic therapy is a combination therapy that's becoming popular in cancer as well as some of the other medical diseases. The concept again is using newer forms of chemotherapy to go specifically after these senescent cells or these exhausted cells. So there have been some trials of it at the Mayo Clinic um, in other diseases, not neurological diseases, but we are planning to um, explore this option in inclusion body myositis. So that's something that I'm working on uh, as I sit home um, and, uh, and be away from my office. And then myostatin, which is a naturally occurring um, muscle protein that causes atrophy of the muscle, um, so there have been a number of trials looking at inhibition or blocking of this myostatin. Um, the Novartis trial um, was, again, using this strategy. There are other um, trials being planned. Regeneron had a trial that they were going to start in IBM, but then they decided to focus on cancer therapy rather than muscle disease. Um, Acceleron, uh, which has a drug, which is a myostatin blocker, is very actively thinking of um, using it in IBM, but there's nothing definite at this point. One of the challenges with myostatin inhibition is there's no doubt that the muscle gets bigger. The muscle volumes definitely increase and improve. Um, and that's been shown in multiple trials, including the most recent Acceleron trial as well. 
the, the, it does not necessarily translate into improvement in muscle strength. Um, so there is only a modest improvement in muscle strength, even though that you have larger muscles by volumetric analysis. Next. Nicole, if you can advance the slides, please. I'm going in the wrong direction. Next. <clears throat> So um, again, the explanation for treatment resistance is that we may be going after the wrong agents. So we need to specifically target the highly differentiated lymphocytes. It's possible that the presence of amyloid uh, and insoluble proteins is what's doing the harm. And we have to figure out a way to accelerate the degradation. And that's what the hope is with aromoclomal and similar agents that do a good job of protein stabilizing and improve clearance of the protein. Um, the, uh, the presence of mitochondrial deletion may be getting in the way, and that's something that we have to think about. And then the realization that this may not be an inflammatory disease and using inflammation it may not be the right strategy on that. The other challenge, and that's something that I've been working on for the last three years, is that we really don't have a good natural history of the disease. We don't know how the disease behaves over a longer period of time. Uh, so doing a two-year study of a disease, which is what most drug companies will allow, allow you to do, may not be a long enough time to show a benefit from it. Um, the other thing we don't know is how the disease behaves in relation to the antibodies. And that's been a subject of a grant that we've, been, we've submitted to the National Institutes of Health. It got a good score, did not get the funding uh, on that. And then um, the other realization, which I've asked um, Dr. Alfano to talk about tomorrow, is that the outcome measures that we use, the six-minute walk test or the IBM functional rating scale, are they the right measures to use in a clinical trial? Are they sensitive enough to show a benefit on that? Our group has been trying to validate a scale or an outcome measure for bulbar weakness, which is your swallowing and chewing and facial weakness. Um, which I think should be used in clinical trials. Dr. Schmidt's group in Germany has been using MRI of the swallowing process as an outcome measure. So there are ways that we can improve, and, and, and I've asked Dr. Alfano and Dr. Schmidt to talk about that. So the take-home message is that anytime you see a patient with inflammatory myopathy after the age of 50, think of IBM, um, and I would not diagnose them with polymyositis. Um, like polyomyositis, 6 to 20% of the patients can present with symmetric weakness, but eventually they will become asymmetric and develop quadriceps weakness. The rimmed vacuoles, which we so heavily depend on for diagnosis of IBM, and, and pretty much all pathologists will not make a diagnosis of IBM unless they say rimmed vacuoles on the muscle biopsy, that may not be seen early in, in the disease. So you can have a muscle biopsy, and the only thing that muscle biopsy will show is inflammation and may not show the rimmed vacuoles. The rimmed vacuoles develop much later in the disease. Um, <clears throat> the, myop the pathology of the IBM is indistinguishable from polymyositis if you don't see the rimmed vacuoles. But there are ways you can make the diagnosis. You can look at mitochondrial stains, especially the, the cytochrome oxidase stains. You can look at <clears throat> the evidence for protein in the muscle, so either you stain for TDP43 or P62. Um, so it really depends on what stains you use, how carefully you look for evidence on that. And the next slide. Next slide, Nicole, please. So, um, and then I was asked to say a few words about the COVID infection. And again, the IBM patients are not necessarily immunocompromised, although we all, um, believe that just the regular process of aging does make a self a little immunocompromised um, is an issue here. Um, as you know, majority of the patients with, with IBM are above the age of 50 and almost half of them are above the age of 65. And given the literature from COVID, we know that it's the folks above the age of 65 who are at the highest risk from complications of coronavirus. Now, on top of that, if you have diabetes, if you have obesity, if you have high blood pressure, and especially if you're treated with medications for high blood pressure, the risk from coronavirus does increase. So from all of those points, patients with IBM are at risk 
from complications of corona. So if there is a group that absolutely has to do social distancing, it's the group with IBM patients. In that. On top of that, there is possibly respiratory muscle weakness in patients with more severe weakness. And that means that if, if these particular types of patients, if they develop a flu-like illness or they have a respiratory illness from the COVID, they're more likely to get in trouble from the disease. So my request, recommendation, plea, whatever you want to call it, is that I know that there is a lot of talk about bringing back normalcy to this country and opening up the country again. We are not ready for that yet. Um, we don't have enough testing. We don't have enough antibody testing. I would strongly urge the IBM community to still be careful, still practice social distancing, um, and try to avoid um, unnecessary risks at this point. Next. Next slide. So again, um, my take home message and my um, optimistic message is that IBM may not be treatable at this time, but there are a number of new treatments that are being developed and explored. There are a bunch of people who are working on different strategies, how to manage this. The NT5C1A antibodies may not be the most sensitive antibody, but given the specificity, has really changed how we manage and diagnose patients with IBM. Um, so if, if a patient with inflammatory myopathy has antibody, I will think away from the diagnosis of polymyositis and consider them IBM. Next. And I'm gonna end this with this beautiful picture of the Alhambra in Granada, Spain, which is where the World Muscle Society meeting was held in 2016. Um, I hope we will come back to normal traveling. And if you guys have not had the chance to visit South of Spain, I would highly recommend it. I'm happy to take any questions comments. I think we're slightly over time. I can stay on for another 10 minutes or so. So please feel free to shoot me questions. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Mozafar, for that wonderful presentation. We are over. So I do want to let people know that we are recording. So if you do need to hop off and attend to other things, please do so. And we will um, provide answers to all your questions. Also, I wanted to just <clears throat> highlight our MBA Resource Center with information to the right of the screen. And this information is, um, can provide information on your care center network, disease information, community events, and so forth. And we are staffed there Monday through Friday from nine to five central time, and typically able to answer your questions within one to two business days. So please go ahead and type in your questions in the Q&A box. So Nicole, I, can I answer some of the questions that I'm seeing? Um, sure. um, so there was one question on when should we expect the results of the aramoclomal trial? That is not gonna happen till 2021. The earliest we probably will see um, any definitive results from it will probably be early parts of 2021 um, on that. Um, it, the drug, the study is not designed to stop early if there's an efficacy. It's mainly designed to stop if there is a concern about safety. There was a question about um, hand surgery and if hand surgery will improve the function uh, or compensate for the weakness. Um, and there's really no scientific studies that have looked at that. And Dr. Bashard, um, Tom Bashard, who's an orthopedic surgeon at Johns Hopkins, has been looking at this and he's presented some of his data at the Myositis Association meeting um, suggesting that there are some surgical techniques that may help with this. Um, but again, it's, it's not universally accepted um, and there's not been comparative trials and other um, uh, um, How do we learn of clinical trials? There is a, a website called clinicaltrials.gov that people can access. It has public access. I would also suggest um, staying in touch with the Muscular Dystrophy Association. and They have um, a page um, for clinical trials. The Myositis Association, which is based in Washington, D.C., um, also has um, a dedicated website for clinical trials. Um, and both, um, I mean, M MDA and the Myositis Association hold local events um, that you can participate in. And Myositis also has an annual meeting that was scheduled to be in Bellevue, Washington this year in September. I'm not sure if it's happening or not, 
um, but you you may want to stay in touch with them. There's a question about um, inherited whether IBM is inherited, and I said um, ninety nine percent of IBM that we see in the clinic is not inherited, so I wouldn't worry about it. Um, the point that I was trying to make is that there are some inherited muscle diseases that sometimes can be confused with IBM. But if you're seeing a good neurologist who has experience, they should be able to pick it apart, especially given that there are other features of the disease that, that are not shared with inclusion body myositis. Uh, <clears throat> um, IBM, uh, aromoclomal is not approved for ALS. The trials for ALS actually failed. Um, that was done in the 2000s. Um, now, granted, they were using a lower dose for, than what we are using currently for IBM. Um, there is a planned trial of aromoclomal in familial forms of ALS, but currently I, uh, aromoclomal is not approved for um, either ALS or IBM on that. Um, Nicole, do you want... Sure. There's a question here that I would just like to um, talk about since it's pretty pertinent right now. Should IBM patients avoid Paquinil? I'm, I'm sorry, what? Should IBM patients avoid Paquinil given for COVID-19? No, I mean, it really depends on what they're getting the Plaquenil for. If they're getting Plaquenil for lupus and other diseases, the answer is you, they should continue taking it. Um, Plaquenil is... Again, it has to be done with the right indication. The problem right now is that it's being um, sort of propagated as the cure for corona without any clear evidence that it does any of that. And in fact, the two studies that have looked at it um, had to be stopped because of toxicity. But if you are already on plaque um, uh, for the right reasons, there's no reason why you need to stop that. Okay. Um, another... Now, oh, go ahead. Sorry. There's a question about when are the clinics opening? And again, will really depend on the state, um, depending on what the governors for each of the states decide. I can tell you that there are talks about at least my institution, the clinics may open um, somewhere in the middle of May. So May 11th is the, the date that I've heard. Uh, but again, it really depends on individual states and individual, and some states have not even peaked yet. And some some states have not really done a great job in terms of social distancing. So I think the next states to watch are the states in the Southeast because they really did not practice um, social distancing and there's still um, an increase in number of cases in those states. Um, what about this question? Can you be more specific regarding how facial weakness is presented in IBM patients? So it's it's something that the doctors can see where the patient has inability to close their eyes completely. They have difficulty with drinking from a straw, uh, whistling um, on that. And then towards the advanced stages, they really have a masked face. They cannot smile. They cannot do much on that. And, and as I said, we didn't really appreciate how prevalent facial weakness was um, um, till recently. Okay. Do you find myopathy of the GI tract along with IBM? That's a difficult question. So um, the, the GI tract has a different type of muscle, and that's usually not affected. But the way human body was designed, a lot of our bowel movements and GI functions are dependent on mobility. So in general, when we lose mobility, we also the, the GI system tends to slow down as well. So constipation becomes an issue in patients who are either wheelchair bound or have significantly reduced mobility. But it, it may not be related to a muscle weakness um, of the GI muscles. Okay. We will probably answer a couple more questions here and then we will wrap it up. Um, one question here, are there any therapies under study hope to halt the progress of the disease or reverse the muscle damage? So, so, um, therapies, sorry. so they're, they're, that's why I was talking about a combination therapy. So the ideal treatment in the long run, um, and unfortunately adds to the cost of the treatment, um, is, would be to, to take a medication that will stop the disease. So it actually directly goes, out, uh, goes after 
the pathogenetic mechanism, be it the inflammation or be it the, the impairment in protein degradation. Um, so let's say, hypothetically, if aromoclomal gets approved, you, you probably want to take the aromoclomal, but aromoclomal is going to stop the damage. You still need something that will improve the disease. The hope is that if you, once you stop the disease process, the body has a chance to heal. But that's where the role of the myostatin inhibitors will probably be important because now if you stop the process and now you can take a drug that increases the muscle mass and hopefully muscle strength, that would be the way to go. So I think in the future, we may see combination therapy, but right now the biggest need is to find a drug that can stop the disease or slow down the progress of the disease significantly. Okay. And our final question that I'll get to, and then we will wrap up. I have IBM, and I'm worried about passing it on to my children and grandchildren. Is this possible? So as I said, 99% of IBM is not inherited. So I won't worry about it. Okay. Well, we do have other questions, and I'm sorry that we cannot get to them right now. I do want you to know that you can feel please feel free to email them to MDA Engage at mdausa.org. You see the email on your screen. Our next session will begin tomorrow at 4 p.m. Central Daylight Time, and we'll feature uh, Lindsay Alfano from Nationwide Children's Hospital, and she will be presenting on outcome measures in inclusion body myositis. And I just want to um, clarify and apologize for any confusion that was thought of today's um, presentation. We did have some technical difficulties with our links, so we did have to resend out links on Friday. And there was a half hour buffer in there for people to log on to avoid any technical difficulties with overwhelming our system. So please note tomorrow's um, session will begin at 4 p.m. Central. And then following the last day of our symposium, we will be emailing you a survey to hear about your experience with the IBM symposium. Hearing feedback from our participants just helps us with programming needs and for future um, seminars and presentations. So we thank you in advance for taking a few minutes to complete that survey. And this concludes today's session of our MDA Engage IBM Virtual Engagement Symposium. It's been a pleasure spending part of your day with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mozafar, for a great presentation, and we look forward to having you participate in our session tomorrow. Have a great rest Thank of your day. Thank you so much, Nicholas. My pleasure. Good night, everyone.